sorry for myself, and as you know, if you're on a crew, um, when, you're, when one person's feeling sorry for herself, you want to make fun of them. So this is a picture taken with that. Um, the reason I was there is because for, and this is, um, this is me, uh, this is what we're doing today, um, in case you weren't sure. The reason I was standing there was because um, it was six months after this photo was taken. And uh, I had spent four years, uh, starting in 1989, leading 60-day wilderness trips for adjudicated youth out of uh, Newark, uh, Camden, um, New York City, um, Philadelphia, Camden, and so forth. Um, and so we'd go out for 60 days, we'd come in for two weeks, drink a lot, go back out for 60 days. I was doing about 300 days a year in the backcountry, which means that I have many of the same injuries that you all have. Um, that's all I share in common with you, uh, knees, ankles, hips. Um, and the reason that picture was taken was because of this gentleman here. Uh, James. James had been one of my first real teachers. He was one of my students. And as you know, when you're out with for 60 days at a time, making sure people are uh, brushing their teeth and breaking up fights and fixing some blisters, you get too close to these kids. Um, and six months after that photo was taken, he was killed in a drive-by shooting. And when you're 20 and you set out to save the world, and within a few years, within a very short time, you deal with your first fatality, which is proof of concept that you failed in your mission to save the world. Um, James had taught me a lot about the reality of his world, and I knew that um, Preston wasn't going to suddenly solve race relations or poverty or uh, socioeconomic status or history or anything else. And, I, and I'm a very pragmatic person, so I thought, all right, I'm done with that. Um, even then, I've gone to too many funerals, and uh, this to these days, I've definitely gone to too many. Um, and I said to myself, what can I influence? And I realized that it's really about navigating uncertainty. And for James, the big problem wasn't the, the history, it was about the four minutes he turned that corner, the two minutes that he turned that corner. And if I could find a way to train or influence that two minutes, because that's what I have background in, maybe I could change the outcome. So for the last 20 some years, I've been doing research on how individuals and teams navigate uncertainty. And a lot of what we're gonna be talking about is based on that principle. It's some of you, some of you had experience where if someone zigged rather than zagged, they'd still be here. And why did that happen? And what can we do to influence that? And what can you do in your world to influence that? Um, so as part of this research, I've gone around the world. The teams that I work with are special operations teams around the world, the elite ones, tactical law enforcement, trauma surgeons, and fire, which is how I got to meet all of you folks. So um, from there, uh, the, the other big picture problem is this one. Um, and this is why I get invited places, because this problem is your problem. In World War II, um, there was, on the, on the left-hand side, I, I forget I can use this thing, over here, 43% uh, of the reason that people were dying were enemy action by the second Gulf, the first Gulf War, it was 20%. 75% of fatalities were accidents. That means, folks, that when we go out and do these things, we're more likely to kill one another than the opposition or the enemy, in your case, the fire. You should be more afraid of the things you're bringing, the people you're bringing with you, than the things that you'll encounter. That's human factor research, and that has to do with um, the people that you work with. So the question is, how do you influence that? As you rise into leadership positions, what are you doing in your day-to-day -day lives to be able to influence the outcomes of those people that work around you so that they'll make better decisions and react better? So um, a couple of years ago, I got to ask Daniel Kahneman, who was recently reminded he won the Nobel Prize not for peace, but for economics. Um, that joke didn't work at all. It was really hard. It's very funny to me. I'll work on my jokes. Um, what happens to experts when the rate of change exceeds the rate of learning? Now, I want you to think about that just for a second, right? Is that we know that your jobs are changing. We know that the, the kinds of incidents that you're being asked to change to are evolving and changing and everything else. If you don't stay constant in your ability to learn, lifelong learning, you're gonna fall behind that and cease to be experts. And the country depends on your ability to adapt to the next problem. One of the things is I go to work with the various teams, the joke that I love to tell them, and this is true, I'm not being facetious at all. Invariably, I'll go to the chow hall or wherever they're eating and I'll sit down and we'll be chatting and I'll lean forward and say, so, no kidding, you know, Navy SEALs or the firefighters, why do you guys exist? And the answer is always the same. Some usually dude, not always, usually dude, leans in conspiratorially and goes, Preston, we solve problems. That's what they say. And I say, that's awesome, except so does my golden retriever and my mom, and I don't want them in charge of the country. <laughs> Solving problems is something you naturally do. The reason that we have you folks, the reason we have these teams, both two and one, is type one and type two, I'm learning the lingo here, is because we need you to solve adaptive problems. 
which means that in your life, you need to adapt as fast as the problem sets are adapting. Because if not, you cease to be relevant to the fight, and those people that, that cease to be relevant cease to exist. <clears throat> One of the things you should be asking yourself is how do you stay relevant and meaningful in your career, and the way that you do that is by learning. History continues to show that teams that fail to adapt are replaced, and the way that human beings and human-based systems adapt is by learning. This is not an easy thing. As an adult, you're no longer a younger person, and you learn differently than you did when you were 18. If you had these struggles this week or in other trainings, you have to remember that if the model that you're using is, no worries, I'll just cram at the end, that works great if your brain is 18-year-olds, less great if it's older than 18. In fact, useless if it's older than 18, and here's the basic reason why. If I empty this room, right, and I pull up a bunch of furniture and say, hey, bring in the furniture, put it wherever you want, no worries. But if I pull up that same uh, uh, truck full of furniture with an already furnished room, it's more complicated. That's what's happening inside your brains. Your brains are already furnished. So every new idea has to get placed in amongst the existing ideas. It's not like an 18 year old where like, sure. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, yeah. Moon is made of cheese, awesome, no. <laughs> So here's the science behind it real quick. The basically that when you're below 25, and the reason that these numbers exist is because psychologists in the last few years have reclassified adolescence because of the way that the prefrontal cortex, this part of your brain continues to form. It's not actually done forming until you're about 25. And here's why that's scary. Well, let me tell you this. The reason that militaries around the world recruit people around 18 is because this is not yet done for me. That's actually really good if you want a bunch of idiots to charge a hill, right? Because they're like, they won't spend a lot of time going, but, right? If the 25 year olds go, you want us to do what now? Like, I'm, I don't think that's a good idea. And that's the difference. It's just physiologically what your brains are doing. An 18 year old is okay with just knowing. Older adults need to understand what are you saying? Why is it meaningful to me? Um, you're externally motivated as a kid. If your teacher tells you to do something, you do it. As an adult, if I tell you to do something, you tell me to have a nice day, unless it's relevant to your life experience. If it is, if it's, um, if it's internally motivated, if I'm co-constructing, if I'm paying respect to your experience, then you'll engage with me. If I don't pay respect to your experience, you won't. And I want you to think about that with your colleagues, your older colleagues. If you're not demonstrating respect for their past experiences, they're probably not listening to you, even if you give a great speech. The other thing you'll hear me say again and again in this talk is, people don't listen, they watch. And so how you behave, regardless of what you say, how you behave is how your subordinates and partners will have to behave. That's the standards you're setting. You can give great speeches, but the truth is, is what you're getting judged on is whether or not you open the door, whether or not you get the chair, whether or not you offer to get coffee. That's the real life stuff that actually all of us have. And if you're not doing that stuff well, the other stuff won't matter because it's expected you're gonna run into the fire after the, after the kids. That's sort of the job. It's the other stuff that's not required that's so important. Um, learner self-evaluates, instructors evaluates learning. I can test you, and I'm not talking about the STEM or that stuff because that's status, that's a change in status. But in terms of your learning, you're evaluating whether or not you've succeeded or not. That's not true for 16 year olds or 18 year olds. You know what you don't know. Uh, Eight-year-olds don't. They just don't know anything. Um, <laughs> and then it just has to be relevant to your life experience. Here's my point. Your brain is made up of, let's say, a lot of pipes, right? A neural, the neural architecture. And as you're getting older, what's happening is you're born with a whole cluster of neurons. And as you get older, the ones you don't use, just like your muscles, get pruned away. That's actually what they call it, pruning and get pruned away. But as lifelong learners, you have to understand that there are no more uh, degrees or finish lines. There's no more like, if I get this check, I'm done. That, that's behind us. If you want to be relevant in your career, it means you have to be a lifelong learner. And just like if you want to be a lifelong runner, you have to run, right? Me learning how to do a marathon in a week isn't gonna work out for anyone. That's true for ballet and opera singing. It won't work out, I'm telling you now. It's gonna take more than a week, if ever. And the, tr the truth is the same with lifelong learning. You have to be engaging if you want to be successful and have neuroplasticity, the ability to adapt to new problems. You have to be forcing yourself to be learning every day to build up those muscles. And that's a choice that you're making. And it's a choice you're not making or you are making no one else. 
Um, experience matters, um, but as leaders, we must find a way to make the tacit explicit. And this is a big part of this course. Tacit knowledge is the knowledge of, that you guys know amongst each other, you men and women know amongst yourselves. So there's a language to fire, just like there's a language to special forces and a language to trauma. And I don't understand that language. But I bet you on a crew, you can turn and say, hey, how, what do we think of Bob? Bob's a jerk. And everybody will know, oh yeah, I get that. And you'll know what you mean by jerk. Except as an outsider, I don't know what you mean by jerk. So I'll say, well, do you mean that he lacks situational awareness or can't anticipate future events or what? He's just a jerk. Okay, great, not helpful. So what I'm saying is, is that part of your responsibility as a leader is to develop the more nuanced language to take your intent, amazing, tacit experience and make it explicit to the people around you so you can articulate what you mean. A big part of your job moving forward is to be able to articulate what you actually mean, not just go, you know, shut up and do better. It's not helpful. You need to be more specific. And part of this course is about giving you a language to be more specific. Um, there's a difference between education and learning. Education is what I'm doing. I'm giving you a bunch of information. Learning is what you're doing. You're absorbing that information. What we need to be really careful about, though, is the misalignment between those two things. Because as Mark Twain says, if a cat sits in a hot, hot stove, right, they may not just decide they don't like hot stoves, but don't like kitchens. And the problem is, is that I know for a fact that in all of our careers, we've walked into our boss's office, got chewed out, and said, I think the message was not to like kitchens. That wasn't what the boss intended, right? And so you come back the next day in a scuba outfit, because that's what you interpreted the events. Wasn't at all the case. And I bet you that's probably happened to one of your subordinates. Like, what note they get? Well, they can't read minds, and they can't understand the gibberish that's coming out of your mouth. So you got to be more specific when you're giving feedback in order for them to hear and influence their own behavior. And that's what this is. So, um, to engage in this particular day, I'm gonna ask a couple of things of you. One is this, um, the phrase Shoshin means beginner's mind. In the beginner's mind, there are many possibilities. In the expert's mind, there are a few. If you're sitting there with your arms crossed saying, I can't wait till this professor's out of the room because he doesn't know my world, he's an idiot, you're right, it's your life. If I'm an idiot to you, I will remain an idiot to you. If you remember that I, um, I come and go as I please, and you have this moment in your life to think about some things you might not otherwise think about, I challenge you to consider it. Consider a new way of thinking. And as I say to the special operations world, you'll get frustrated with me sometimes, learning French does not make you French, all right? Learning a different language to describe things doesn't change your belief system. It just gives you more tools to describe the work that you already do and do well. The premise of this whole talk is that all the experience that you need, you have. That's not the problem. It's expressing that experience in meaningful ways that other people will understand. So this is this is oh, this is the um, um, I'm gonna get a drink of coffee here. Um, this is the model that I use to explain mission mission uh, critical event life cycle. The easiest way for you to understand how I think about it is to give you this example. When I work with special operations, imagine that there's a door here, a threshold. On the other side of that door is something bad. Mostly, we're 90% sure something bad is on the other, that, other side of that door. So what I've done is I've gotten four very dangerous people, well armed and well trained, and we've lined up on this door. We have to cross that threshold into the other side. And the whole thing is gonna get resolved in about four minutes or less. In the FDNY, most of the average fire is under control in nine minutes or less. For special operations, they clear a house in under 60 seconds. This is the time frames that a lot of these things are happening. And so a lot of things have to go into how do you both execute on that, and then afterwards, how do you make meaning of it? Because our ability to remember those experiences are really diminished due simply to our neuro architecture. So, Basically, I'm gonna tell you a story now, and I'm gonna walk you through this whole process. So I'll, I'll, you'll see it again, but I'm gonna break it down in detail and tell you a story. This story is in your materials, so if you wanna come back and look at it later, you're welcome to. So, the first thing you need to understand is that a few years ago, like 100 years ago, I was a safety officer down in a Marine, um, uh, Marine Center uh, down in the Florida Keys, Big Pine Key. You have to picture me much younger with hair and a six pack and very attractive. So if you could picture that, that would be awesome. 
Um, and so I'm down on the Florida Keys, and my job is to do um, open ocean rescue, dive rescue. I was a wilderness EMT and did search and rescue both terrestrial and offshore, a civilian job. We had about 100 vessels, we had scientists from around the world, and then we had a bunch of students. So I had a team that did that, we had chase boats, the whole bit, yep. And so um, I had the, uh, my CEO came in one day and she says, hey, my niece Sam, who works here, and I was like, yeah, very young Sam, yes. She, we're gonna put her in charge of property for the day. And I was like, this is a really bad idea. And she said, well, nobody will be here, it's just staff, and it's a holiday, like a Thanksgiving, I just wanna give her experience of being in charge, having some authority. Again, really bad idea, but okay, I'll be there, so we'll just play it by ear. Yes, boss. So that day, I need to just run into town for a second, right? Famous last words. You need to run into town for a second. Um, so I, I get in my truck and I, I leave property. And I'm gonna be gone eight minutes. It's not a big island. I'm gonna be gone eight minutes. Well, what I don't know is that John, John's one of the people that works on our docks and lives on a houseboat just off of our, our place. About once every other day, John rides into town in his flip-flops and his shorts and his t-shirt. I've never seen him, for the four years I knew him, I never saw him in long pants. So that's, I, I'm pretty sure he had three sets of clothes and his bike and his boat, and that was it. So he's gonna ride into town and pick up some supplies. But John's old beat up bike was this bike with serrated pedals, the old metal pedals, and he would ride in flip-flops. But for the last five or six years, he had, didn't have a kickstand, so he'd take his bike and just put it down on the moral ground. So every time he did that, it sharpened the, um, the pedals, basically, turned them into little knives. And on this particular day, the period of condensation emerged, that this all led to an event where he stepped, he missed a, hit a bump, came down and lacerated his pedal artery, just cut it in half. So right on the inside of his leg. So it's a bad day for John. And Sam's in charge, and I'm off property, okay? This is the period of condensation. So if you think about a glass, right? And the reason I call it that is that if you think about a glass on your desk <coughs> that's full of water, on certain days with just the right conditions, mist condensation will form on the outside. And under just the right conditions, it'll condense and a drop of water will come down. A lot of the incidents that you go through, whether you call it a Swiss cheese model or whatever, have that same sort of dynamic. The right conditions under the right settings will produce a, a, a phase effect, and suddenly you'll have an event. And that's what was going on. In this particular event, before we get there, right, because I'm still off property, I don't know what's going on, all I know is a crisis has occurred, and I'll explain what I mean in a minute. But what you need to know is that in particular, while this is going on, this equilibrium, this normal, right, we're still left to bend. The story, I'm not yet gone to where he lacerates the article, so we're, if, if you think about the timeline to that moment, we're still left of that in the timeline. That's what's called left of bang. And we're about to get to bang, the crisis. And then we're gonna talk about it. But what we need to think about is the development of the human factor. So John, Sam, and I, right? The problem set, all the things that led to the dynamics that led for that laceration to happen, and the context, what's going around property, what resources do I or don't I have within that environment for me to do something about it. So, there I am, I'm still out there, right? Oh, I'm gonna stop here and pause and just explain a little bit about complexity and problem science, because this is helpful. As I said before, we're not asking you just to be problem solvers, we're asking you to be adaptive problem solvers. If they were just technical problems, if they were just problems where we knew what the problem was and we knew the solution, we wouldn't need you, all right? Um, someone once said to me, when I was working with kids in trouble, I said, they said, Preston, how's it going today? And I said, it's fine, but those guys are such jerks. And he leans in, he goes, they weren't jerks, we wouldn't need you. And I was like, oh yeah, that's a good point. Um, so the problem set, they're emergent, meaning that you can't predict them. So a lot of teams now are having to embrace both contingency planning and capacity building. You can't just predict the future. You also have, have, you have to have the capacity of the team to, resolve, to respond to whatever the alien zombies that show up, right? So you were setting out to do this, and then that thing showed up. And you gotta have the wherewithal to pivot to that thing. Because otherwise it's gonna steamroll over. You could be doing a great job here, it won't matter. Secondly, they're complex, they're interdependent. And where you see the interdependent part is the politics stuff or the social stuff, right? You're having to walk in, you're flying into a situation that's evolving and accept that your ex-boyfriend is over there and this person you got into a fight when you're 20 and this person is your cousin's best friend and this person you owe five bucks to. And all of that plays into your ability to do a job. And that may not do anything to the problem, but if you don't solve all that, you're not getting anywhere. 
And so they're interdependent. All of these human factors, social problems, the ecosystem's interdependent, and you have to own the whole problem. And the last one is adaptive. Sometimes when you go to put a solution over here, you're creating a problem for yourself over here. It moves around, it flexes, it, come, it can become a little bit of a whack-a-mole. And so knowing that, and knowing that might happen, arms you to sort of take care of things. I also just want to introduce you to the different way that some researchers, in this case Hyfix, thinks about problem sets. There's a technical problem, and that's where you have a broken bike, like the, the chain's broken, well, okay, you, can, you know what it is, you know how to fix it, you can do it yourself. The next kind of problem, a technical adaptive problem, however, is a problem where you know what the problem is, your well's gone dry, but just digging deeper may not be the solution. You're gonna need an expert to figure that out. Um, and you may have experts on hand, but it's not intuitive, and, and digging might not be the solution, right? So you're gonna have to figure out other stuff. And complex adaptive often emerge without warning and immediately starts to evolving. They're hard to identify and a technical solution will not suffice. Later, Colin Fox is gonna tell us a story about the Ebola virus. That's an example of complex adaptive. Big fires, just so you understand my ignorance of some of your world. When I arrived here a couple of days ago and I would think about wildland fire, I always thought in the paradigm of urban fires or what I knew, FDNY or San Diego fire. I thought it was just a bigger house fire, but it's not. It's, a, it's like a natural disaster. It's more like a hurricane, it's more like a tornado. And it wasn't until then it really clicked in my head like, oh, got it, and that's what makes it a complex adaptive problem. It's bigger, it has more dynamics, and there's more variables in play. It's not contained in the same way. So, um, contact resolution. Again, when you're looking at the context, so we have the human factor of resolution, me, John, John uh, Sam, and myself. And there's variables there that we're not touching upon in this course, but how you decide to build your team, how you're selecting, training, and developing people have everything to do with how you shape your human dynamics. And that's, that's beholden to you and no one else as leaders. Then we've had the problem set, how that's evolving, all the different parts that are coming into play, right? And now we're talking about the context. So how big is it? What's the spatial environment? Is it a house fire or is it a forest? And that's very different, because, and it's very different depending on who you're talking to. Because you'll be on the radio talking to a lot of people, and if conceptually they don't understand the spatial environment that you're in, they're gonna misunderstand what you're asking them. So being able to communicate that matters. Secondly, the temporal environment. The temporal environment's important to take a minute to explain the neuroscience of this. Um, if, if Rowdy, if, I'm gonna use Rowdy again here, if Rowdy is my boss up in um, a safe space drinking his cup of coffee, right? Someone just handed it to him, he's got his feet on his chair and he's thinking about what the budget is or the strategy for the next year. He's in what's called the prefrontal cortex. He's up here and he's doing what's called top-down thinking. This part of the brain down. His needs are met and he's thinking and he can think expansively, but he's thinking in a time frame of weeks and months. If you are over here calling in my radio covered in someone else's blood and you're thinking in seconds, you're, you're back in your limbic system. You're using your training and you're calling for help. And you're doing what's called bottom-up thinking. You're in a very different reality. You're in a very different temporal zone, time zone, than he's in. And unless you communicate to them, to each other, what's going on, you'll misalign that. And, and conversations won't get aligned. That's important conversation to have, especially when you're not eye to eye. And lastly, system dynamics. We've all been in situations where, like we said before with the politics, where you're setting out to do one thing, fight a fire, but there's a lot of other variables in play, money, politics, feelings, all sorts of things that are gonna affect your ability to do that that you need to get a handle on. Knowing what those are matter. So, going back to our story. So, I'm out there getting my supplies, whatever they are, uh, movies to rent or whatever, this is back when you did that. Um, and, um, a crisis is occurring. I don't know it yet. All crisis means is unknown outcome. That's all it means. The reason we think of it as negatively is because we don't like unknown outcomes. Could be I'm winning the lottery. I don't know it. Right? I bought a lottery ticket. I might, I don't, they don't announce it until tomorrow. I won. I just don't know it yet. That's technically a crisis. It's an unknown outcome. I'm making that decision. In this particular case, I'm off property and uh, John's just lacerated his ankle and I don't know it yet, but whatever plans I had that day, at that, I just don't know it yet. So what happen, needs to happen is a moment of recognition. And this is challenging for a bunch of reasons, but I want to explain the mechanics of how you recognize an emergence crisis. 
So there are two ways that you do it, precognitively and cognitively, and I'll explain it this way. If, you know the equalizers on your stereo? You know those things that would go like this? And they, I never know how they worked, but they're, supposedly they do certain things, and you can see certain things, and I just thought they were colorful lights. But anyway, they're all doing this, right? So imagine that they're connected to your smell, to your sight, to your hearing, to your skin feeling, and to your taste, all right? So each one of these lights is an indication of these things, and they're always doing this. Whenever you walk into a new environment, any new environment, when you walk into this room, when you go home tonight, the first thing your brain does by default is a threat assessment. The way it does that is it looks for patterns, cues, they call them cues, of things that your brain has registered historically as bad, right? So what's going on is that this is always going, you walk into a room, and all of a sudden you smell something weird. That's the thumb here. It's like, and your brain's like, that's weird. And then all of a sudden you hear something, like a squeaking, and you're like, that shouldn't be here, right? Right? So smell, sound, and then you see someone run by without clothes on. And you're like, okay, right? At that point, that's a threat assessment. Believe it or not, those three things alone is enough to say this, okay, we're, we're, we're well outside what normal is. And you'll, you'll actually go into a threat assessment, you'll go into fight, flight, freeze. Here's the important part. If you're trained, I was trained as an EMT, my fight, flight, freeze has been affected by my training. So I've been through iterations trained to react a certain way. So I'll default to my medical training. If we put Bob Bear, who's a uh, former, he's on the phone right now, former colonel in the Marines, if we put him in enough stress, he's gonna to revert to Marine training. That's the way the brain works. But if you encounter a problem that you have no background in, you'll default to fight, flight, freeze. And what struggle for that, and you'll hear that in some people's stories, is people that are highly confident but are faced with a problem they've never experienced before are thrust into incompetence. And that's really scary because you're physiologically being driven into fight, flight, freeze, and you're not used to that because it's not where you normally operate from. That's what's happening precognitively. At the same time, experts, beginners, for example, build patterns, but experts look for dissonance in patterns. What I mean by dissonance is the sound, if you're listening to music, someone's singing and all of a sudden a bad note comes out, you're like, oh, like that? That's dissonance. It shouldn't be there. It's a note that doesn't fit with the rest of the pattern. But you all, here's an example of how this works in your world, most of you have really good uh, acuity to radio sounds. You know what normal radio chatter should sound like. And you're very keen on when it doesn't sound that way. When the tone is off, when the volume is off, when the words are off. You, we've all probably had that experience where we're talking to an experienced person who's talking to you but also listening to the radio. You're having this conversation, all of a sudden they totally tune you out and point themselves towards the radio and reach for the thing. Not because anyone yelled for help, but because something in that pattern shouldn't be there. And it might just be somebody going, hmm, could be that, right? And that's enough that an expert will go, that's a break in the pattern, I'm just gonna follow up on that. And experts know to look for dissonance in patterns. So when I get out of the car, when I come back and get out of the car, I get out of my car, I walk onto the property and there's bloody footprints heading towards uh, my first aid station. That means that's sort of a blinking, blazing light, but clearly that's not supposed to be there, right? And that's an indication that things are bad. The other thing that's weird that's registering is there's no one around. Right? So what's going on in my head is, there's no one around, bloody footprints going to where the only person around is Sam. And I'm like, oh God. So I start moving to the first aid room. Now, once I get there, right, I'm gonna do what's called, I'm gonna drop into what's called an immersion event. And we've all been there. Um, if you've ever responded to a crisis, it, it, it feels like jumping into a pool. You can't, you can't suddenly press pause or say, you know what, I'm gonna go get coffee first. It doesn't work out that way. Once you're there, you're in it. And you're in a different temporal time zone and space and reality than other people. They won't understand it if they weren't there. It's different. And so I open the door, right? I'm like, I got my little bag, I open the door, and here's what I see. John, looking embarrassed, but pale white, and a floor about a third of the covered with his blood, and Sam yelling at the phone. <laughs> phone! Right? Because she, with no experience, she's seeing this, and she just wants the phone to work, and she's forgotten how to use the phone. Because that's what happens. The amygdala, in a fight, flight, freeze situation, can't do abstract thinking. What we used to train our young medics on is if you come on the scene, if you're brand new and you're working with me, I trained you, I literally make you do this over and over again, became a habit, 
I would say, when we get there, I'm going to point to you and yell time. And my argument was, I need to know when we start. That wasn't the case. The amygdala can't do abstract thinking. So what will happen is, the new kid will come on, blood, guts, like, oh my gosh, I'll see the eyes go wide, and I'll yell, time! And they're more afraid of me than that, right? So they'll go, okay, and they'll go, watch! Because that's all that part of the brain knows. They can't, it's like, watch! And I was like, yes, what time? Watch! And, and, and it will take them a second to be like, 2.15, great, go get the kid, okay! And then once you get a momentum, they're okay. But the problem is the amygdala can't do abstract thinking. And so a lot of times when people are stuck there, like trying to be like, boom, that's what's happening. So as I mentioned before, I'm trained, right? So I've crossed the event horizon threshold. I've had a moment of recognition. I've recognized we have a real problem. I recognized initially that something was wrong. Now I recognize what the problem actually is, okay? So, I've crossed the event horizon threshold, I'm now in the middle of it, and I have a moment of reaction. Like I said before, I'm trained as a medic, so, or as an EMT, excuse me. Some medics actually get upset by that, like, per, like I'm a professor, but I'm not really a professor. The actual real professor, people get censored about this stuff. So, so what I meant to do was, what my training would do is grab the gauze, right? Spin to the open wound, clamp, put pressure, elevate, right? You're all with me here. That's my training, that's what it will do, however, What's happening with a person who has experience is what's called a cortical authority threshold. And basically what that is, is, is that what I know I need to do, what I've been educated to do, is that I need to move from reaction to response. It's not just enough to fix that problem. I have to own the whole problem, including Sam, including getting help, including some other things. My gut just wants to stop the bleeding. That's my reaction. But my response needs to be to own the whole problem. So, this cortical authority is the ability for you to take control over that part of your brain that just wants to react and crank it physically forward so you can widen out and go, what's the bigger problem here? And the bigger problem is, I'm not gonna be able to coach Sam through how to use a phone, right? That's, that ship has sailed. So what I need to do is get Sam out of the way and stop the bleeding at the same time. So I pause, I literally grab God's move to wound, move back to Sam, Grab sand, not unkindly, um, grab, put gauze in thin, yank her over, slap her hand in gauze onto the wound, right? Grab her chin, hold! And she's like, hold! And I went back to the phone and I called for help, right? And the reason that matters is because some folks will get, think that by reacting, they're getting the job done. And your job as leaders is to go beyond that, to, to first react and then move to response but that takes practice to get that cortical authority threshold met. So, we've, we got the bleeding stopped. Medics, my friends, arrive with all their cool gear and their uniforms and their badges. I'm so happy to see them. And they walk in the door and they're like, we got this, and for the first time I can take a deep breath. That moment of stabilization. And that's really, really feels like that. It's a, it's a period where you really feel like you cross the surface, the surface horizon, and come back up for air out of the immersion event. We've all had that experience like, okay, I'm not gonna die, I'm not gonna kill everybody in the process, or worse, they're all gonna die and I'm gonna be alive to explain why I killed them all, right? So that process of, of getting to the surface again, taking a deep breath. And then lastly, the moment of recovery where we do the after action review or every team has some version of this, but how do we collectively make meaning of that experience that just happened? And there's a couple of reasons why together makes sense. It's not about making everybody feel better. That's been a big confusion over the, world, over the last 10 years. Like, we need to do PTSD, or we need to do uh, after action reviews because we want to make sure everybody feels good about our lessons learned. The truth is, is that when you're in that immersion event, this part of the brain not only can't do abstract thinking, it can't remember. And so your memories of what happened are suspect at best. And so collectively, you actually have to make meaning together of what actually happened. What, what, what did we actually go through? And you should not trust your own voice, and you should certainly not trust your own critique of yourself, because it's probably false. So after that, there's a closure threshold, and that's where the team officially say the story is over. Some people have some confusion over this, and I want to clarify what this means. There are gonna be some stories and events that tag you, no question, if you're in this business for any period of time, you've all had that experience where one hangs on. Either you didn't do what you did your best work, or somebody died, or it's just sad and tragic and that hurts, and it lingers. 
And as a leader, what is helpful to help these people that have these experience or help us manage this is to be able to say, hey folks, we're gonna go ahead and do our after action review. We're gonna have, everybody's gonna have their say, we're gonna talk about it, and I as a leader am gonna bring closure to this event. I'm gonna say it's over, I'm not gonna bring it up again, right? We've learned what we've learned, we're putting it behind us, we're moving forward. That allows us to do a couple of things. People that are feeling guilty or scared or afraid of the repercussions can take a deep breath and say, okay, it's behind me, I can now live my life again. But the people who are unable to let it go, the people that are still mad at one another, those people will rise to the surface. They suddenly become really obvious. And then you as the leader can say, folks, I thought we let that go, but we're still talking about it. what's going on. I'm fine, clearly you're not, so let's talk about it. Right? Or the person who says, hey, can I just chat with you because I'm not done with it. Great, we need to know that too. But you as a leader have to have the ability to set the rhythms of the teams, and as the tribal leaders, and there's some truth to this, you have to tell people what we're caring about, right? And we're saying that's over, that's over. Uh, the new normal. Um, the new normal um, is really important, and I want to express it this way. Um, whenever we go through something really important, um, something that's really impacted us and knocked us way down, and I want to talk about, introduce you some terms that will help with this concept. I often talk about robustness, resilience, and adaptability. Robustness is the ability to take the hit and not fall down. We often make the mistake of confusing that with strength. It's not. Sometimes the right answer is to take the hit and fall down because that's the smart thing to do. That's called resilience. Resilience is taking the hit, falling down, and getting right back up. The better thing to do is what's called adaptability. Get out of the freaking way, right? Let the thing go up. You don't have to catch everything that's thrown at you. And so this notion of, of how we're building within our teams robustness, resilience, adaptability. This is important. And when we talk about the new normal, there are folks that want to, because they've been so shattered or shocked by an event, they want to go back to the old way. I just want to go back to the way things were normal again. You'll hear young kids in Shattered Families saying that. I just want to go back to the way it was. And unfortunately, as we know, they can't, and neither can we. As leaders in this work, we're gonna be constantly adapting to the new normal. Every time we go through an event, we're learning something new. And so is our team, and we're changing the dynamics and the way that we're communicating and working together. That kid that started off as a rookie, well, they're no longer a rookie because they just lived through that. They're a veteran now. And they're gonna to expect to be treated that way because they just lived through it, the hardest thing they've ever lived through. That's not the problem in my mind. The problem is this. So here's um, Bill. Bill's the hero of this story. He's a leader. This is Preston. Preston's the loser in this story, right? And Bill and Preston are gonna take a walk 60 miles, right? 60 miles. And what we've decided is that we're gonna take a bearing of 180 degrees because that's the mission of our organization. That's the task that we have set out behind, in front of us. And this is what we're gonna do. We're gonna march 180 degrees for 60 miles. Problem is, mile one, something happens, something important happens to the team. Maybe um, an incident, whatever, a new learning, and we realize Given this new information, this new normal, what we need to do is actually be on 181, right? Course correction to 181. But here's the problem. Preston, Preston's a curmudgeon. He's been doing this a long time. He's seen a lot of these course corrections, a lot of these classes on stuff. He's seen a lot of the new policies and procedures. I've been fighting fire a long time, kids. I've been on 180 for 20 years. It served me just fine. So we put the wet stuff on the red stuff and call it a day, right? I don't need to go to your 181. I'm going to stay just fine and you won't notice. But here's the problem in today's rapidly changing world, right? The rate of change problem. It's the 9-11 problem. The world no longer looks like it did. And if you as leaders can't adapt, it looks like this. Because as we're moving along, the slope of that change is such that the first 10 miles, Bill looks over and I look pretty close. I look like I'm still on 180. But by the time we get to the next incident at 60 miles out, we're one mile apart. And at one mile apart, I'm too far away to help. Culturally, emotionally, physically, whatever it is. And the problem is, folks, is that new people, young people, they kill themselves, but leaders kill everybody. And one mile apart's too far. So if you're gonna be in this business and you wanna stay in this business and stay relevant, that means that you have to continue learning. You have to continue to stay adaptable. You have to continue to stay, be able to do these course corrections. And if you can't, you're becoming a danger to yourself and others. 
And you can spend a lot of time talking yourself into the belief that you're good, you should be good for 20 years, only if you assume that 20 years is the same. And I stopped wearing bell bottoms a long time ago. So I'm gonna suggest they ain't the same. So um, with that said, I just wanna go back through this one more time and then I'm gonna introduce Rabbi. It's, you're going through a period of the normal, right? There's an emergence of an event, you drop into an immersion event, you come out the other side, there's a period of stabilization and there's a new normal, that's why it goes up like that. There's a crisis, there's a cortical authority threshold, there's a service horizon and then there's closure. Why does this matter? This matters, this model is theoretical, it's interesting. Now I'm gonna explain why it's relevant to today and why it's relevant to what I just said and what Rowdy's about to do. All of you, like all the teams that I study, come from an oral tradition. The way that you communicate is by telling stories. The way you probably grew up is because some gray hair, some gray beard said, come on in, I want to tell you something. And they're like, there's this one story. And there's probably times where somebody in your troop is doing really well or really bad, they're like, come here, I want to tell you a story. That's the way you communicate norms, that's the way you communicate lessons, it's the way you communicate things. The problem is, is that stories by themselves don't always um, uh, deliver the message. It's the cat on the hot stove. Some people leave that story going, right, of which gyms, because they didn't hear what you said. This model here is meant to be used so that when you're telling a story or you're hearing one of your subordinates tell a story, that you can zero in and say, you know what? It doesn't sound to me like you recognized all the problems that you were facing. Do you, can you articulate which problems were in front of you? Oh, I see, yeah, that one emerged later, got it. It sounds like you reacted really well to the problem, but you didn't respond very well. Like, you, you, you it instinctually went the right way, but when you took your, or you didn't respond at all, you just kept reacting. Or when you did respond, you decided to incorporate scuba divers. Not useful, right? So I don't know why you zigged that way, so let's talk about that. Or it sounds like you did all that stuff, but it's two years later and we're still talking about it. it. Sounds like you're not recovering from it. By giving you this language, it's able to take the expertise and the experience you already have, the stories you already tell, and give you a language to be more precise with it, to be able to articulate specific things more accurately. So that the people that are working with you, that you're in service to, that you're developing, that you can take their stories and unpack them and help them make meaning together, collaborate with them to make meaning of their own lives in a much more precise way. So that's the purpose of today, and that's the purpose of us telling you these stories, is to help you take what you already do really, really well and do it a little better. Make sense? Okay. Um, is there anything add, I would add, Rowdy, before, I should add before I introduce you? Rowdy? We're, we're gonna do the we're gonna take a break is what we're gonna do, um, obviously, because um, I keep forgetting. Um, we're gonna take a 15 minute break and then we're gonna come back right in here and then we're gonna talk about what I forgot to say. Thank you very much, 15 minutes.